You might have heard about this NeoVim plugin called Harpoon. It's made by a pretty famous uh, NeoVim related streamer and YouTuber, the Primogen, with whom I have quite a lot of issues, mind you. So, what is this plugin for? It's a for a very common situation. Say you are in NeoVim and maybe um, in Remaps. Okay, good. Uh, now I want to quickly go to init.lua and actually do this and repeat chat here, blammo. Uh, cool, I'm in init.lua. Uh, and then let's go to xremap. Three files that I want to be working on almost simul simultaneously without tiling them all together. Uh, and then now I want to go back to remaps, for example, because uh, maybe it's a file that I need to edit very often. What options do I have now? The first one, the obvious one, is to just search for it again. And again. And again. For a file that you uh, edit very, very frequently, you'll end up searching for it billions of times. Well, maybe not to that extent, <laughs> sure, but you will notice editing some files more frequently than others. The other option is to set a global mark. So, we go to re, we go to remaps. I said, that's not remaps. Hold up. Uh, we go to remaps. We set a global mark uh, to the file, and blammo. Then, when we want to go to that file, we go to that global mark. What's the issue here, though? The issue is that when you use global marks, they don't just set uh, the file they set the file and the cursor location. Meaning, if you made the mark, whether it's local or global actually, um, it will be to this place specifically, because that's where your cursor was. So, marks are for locations within the file. Why is that an issue? It's not usually an issue. However, um, what if you went here, for example? I'm editing these mappings for one reason or another. I quickly go to X remap. I'm like, mm hmm, look, I just added a new uh, remap. Now let's go back. Like, imagine me using a global mark. I can't use them for a reason I'll explain later. Uh, but yeah, basically, say I go to this file back, and where I would end up if I use the mark is not here, I would end up wherever we were. So where we set the mark, which I think is here. So global marks will not give you the usual benefit of enter the file where I last exited it. No, instead they will always punch you to the same location. Well, when you search for a file like this, you will end up at that file where you last were. So Harpoon solves this issue by providing you an array uh, of files that you can append or prepend to. So, for example, remaps uh, and uh, init.lua and remaps, oh, oh, and xremap. Kind of strange that, oh right, it doesn't display the current file. So yeah, these three files, we can add them all to that harpoon list to number one, two, and three. And then we can use a much simpler key map for harpoon uh, I used to use the double quote that expects a number 
and then goes to the file stored in that harpoon number. What that means is that you can very quickly jump to files that you edit often. And the extra benefit of harpoon is the fact that uh, it's per project, more broadly per current working directory. So I am currently in dot .files. Um, so all of the harpoons, we can call them, will be binded to this directory. But if I switch to something like Glaza, those are no longer active. Uh, and instead, the harpoons in this directory will be active. And Glaza is my Rust project that I'm currently refactoring. So what I might have had is like main is first, args is second, actions is third. That kind of idea. Uh, and then I come back to dot .files. And my previous harpoons are now active for dot files. That is pretty cool. However, harpoon is made in a very strange way, design wise. Specifically because it uses numbers. And them and new of them we're very used to um, registers, the idea of registers. We have marks that just use keys on your keyboard to set those marks to. We have registers like clipboard registers, as in store this text in register G. Uh, so the idea of registers is very clear, we could say. And then for some odd reason, Harpoon, instead of using registers, it uses numbers. It's not really a big deal, because um, it's like, it's whatever, it would just use numbers. You have like 10 numbers, so should be easy enough, right? Uh, you just make remaps um, to go to that number. However, number two, say I want to once again add xremap, and for me, the file xremap feels very much like the number six. There's no particular reason, but for me, it's a mnemonic that I instantly memorize. If it had to be at like place number three, it would be more difficult to connect my memory to. You feel me? And in Harpoon, very unfortunately and stupidly, you can only place a, uh, a file to a number if you have that many files stored. What do I mean? So, three files I currently showed you. Uh, I can place them in 1, 2, 3. However, I could not place one of them to 6, because then there would be uh, the empty indexes of 4 and 5, and those empty indexes will be cleared, and what I tried to put at 6 will jump down to 4. So I cannot have gaps in Harpoon, which really sucks. Then, as a workaround, you may try to just duplicate the same file three times, but you can't do that either, if I remember correctly. Like, you specifically need to put in uh, different files to be able to put something at a specific index. Which is so fucking strange! Because, first of all, this should have been about registers to begin with, like another register layer uh, that you can easily assign mnemonics to. There, there are 26 of them, um, and 52 if you used uppercase too. But with numbers, making mnemonics is quite a bit more difficult. 
So, I was annoyed with that, really annoyed. I tried making Harpoon work for me, uh, but I realized that I like the idea. I like the main idea of quickly jump to a file that you edit very often um, and store them somewhere. So I remade the functionality for my own. It is called harp because harpoon without the un, harpoon without the extra bullshit that it really doesn't need and it's strange that it works this way. What a terrible design. Uh, wow, Primogen, you've been working in the industry for so many years, yet you came up with such a terrible design. How dare you? Very long name, yeah. So, how does it work? Uh, it works against all the disadvantages that I listed about Harpoon. Let me first of all just show you me using it, uh, so I could like show you how easy it is. Uh, I press M, R, and I go to Remaps. Why? Because I uh, can go to Harp. Let's try to. Mm -hmm. Wait, I, wait, hold up. Oh, I already marked it. <laughs> hold up. Let me try to find a file that I haven't marked. Uh, this one is good. Yes, C is empty. Okay, so let me show you how to mark a file. I do leader M. That's just my keybind. You can pick some other one. It doesn't matter. Uh, brings up a prompt here that asks for a single character, which will be uh, the the register where we will store the file name of this file. I press C because I want to store it in C. And now it says prah C. Why prah? Because when we jump somewhere, it says harp. <laughs> and I decided that setting a register uh, being like the opposite would be pretty funny. <laughs> so I made it that way. So we can jump and we can set the current file. And then you might have noticed if I try to go to a register that doesn't exist, S for example, it will say S is empty. And we're like, uh-huh, so let's uh, pick this file and add it to S. Blamo. So now I have multiple files that I edit very often. This one, because it's a snippets uh, plugin specification. And I write a lot of snippets. So I may come to here often. Remaps, because I might change them often. Harp, because I recently made it. Uh, init.lua, xremap, and you see how easy and fast it is to move to all of these files? I did them really often, and being able to move this swiftly is really, really nice. How does this work? Very simply, it creates a directory uh, in your home that local share harp. This is specifically for Linux and it should work for uh, Mac OS. Uh, but I only like made it for myself for Linux. Uh, you'd have to use a different path on Windows, I think. So it creates a directory. And then for every register that you set, it creates a file with that file name. Let's go to uh, share harp, right? And here it has all of the registers that currently exist. And then we can for file in everything cat 
file end. Huh. <laughs> it added them all together. That's <laughs> that's pretty silly. Um, let's actually make this look a bit nicer. Let's just echo. Like this. Yeah, here we go. So, yeah. All of these files simply have full paths that I set. And the get function just reads one of those files and either edits that file or tells you that that register is empty. Now, technically, this should be just like one file that holds all of that data, but I could not be bothered to write that in Lua. My first rendition of this feature, I actually wrote a Rust program for this called Harp, uh, where I used a YAML parser and all of this info was stored in the YAML file. However, that's a syscall, a system call uh, that I would need to do from within NeoVim. And it's not going to be necessarily that slow, but it is pretty like silly to do, you know? So I decided against it and rewrote it in this like dumber way in Lua, but a way that works. If any of you are interested in parsing YAML in Lua, you can go ahead and take my idea and make it better. Um, Cause I don't actually intend to like make this into a proper plugin with its like all readme and easy installation through lazy and all that stuff. Uh, truthfully, I don't know how to do that and I don't particularly care. As in style with my channel, I usually just make some config and share it. I don't often like to make it all pretty and nice. Uh, I do that with like more proper projects, uh, which are usually in Rust. So yeah. Uh, Blamo. So this is almost the entire code because uh, I reference some global functions here. So uh, let me wait now. This. Let me go to dot files and ghl this. XCP, blam, blamo. So this is this file uh, that will most definitely change in the future. So to give you a static link, parse branch, uh, head, and this is the static link that will not change. Then both this function and this function are in global functions. So let me give you a link to this as well. And a static one. Blamo. Yeah, so I'm really happy with this because uh, it implements the idea of Harpoon in an actually reasonable way. Now, to be fair, uh, these registers are global. So they will act the same regardless of where I am. If I go to Glaza and try to go to R, I will still go to R. It's still set, even though I'm in a different uh, current working directory than I was before. See? So there's no like per project things. And while that would be a cool feature, it's honestly not like the number thing that I'm looking for. I might want to edit some dot file in, in spur of the moment. 
kind of like ad hoc. And I want to have easy access to those files like very easily and very often. I want that functionality way more that I'm interested in per project stuff. Because at the end of the day, I can just bind uh, them to numbers, for example. And then I can just update uh, those numbers as I'm working on different projects. It's really not a big deal. But then, of course, uh, I could make it so there are both global registers and local registers. I might do that in the future, but I, I don't think I care. Yeah. Cool, isn't it? I actually uh, didn't mention this last stream. I didn't even hint at it, uh, but it was already visible. The fact that I'm no longer using Neovide, when I scrolled on stream, it would like visibly lag, and right now everything is instant. That's because I am no longer using Neovide. If you look here, I only have Alacrity, Alacrity, and Vivaldi here open. No Neovides here. So why? Because my computer isn't, like, isn't insane. Usually, Neovide is completely fine. It uh, loads the animations perfectly, uh, isn't a resource hog, everything is good. However, if I pressure my computer even slightly, blammo, now it kind of lags. If I'm streaming, for example, it lags. If I have a uh, MPV window open for some reason, it lags. Um, if otherwise um, my computer is like doing a lot of work, it lags and just becomes slower. And then, especially with something like telescope, with something that is supposed to be um, very, very fast, like here, for example, me opening telescope and typing in something, it then becomes kind of slow. And my idea is that it's not actually slow, but just that the animations are slow, so it feels like it's slower, even if it isn't. But regardless, Neovide was often not worth it. Unfortunately, because it's really pretty, but I can't handle it all the time. If I could, I would still be using it, but there are way too often situations where I cannot handle it. Then, sometimes, uh, like here with harp, for example. Mm. How do I actually show this? I'm not sure. So, okay. Um, oh, wait, I know. Let's try to rename this variable uh, through LSP. I end up being here, and therefore my cursor moves as well. In new avide, it would not. It would realize once I pressed uh, some key, like it would realize right now and jump my cursor from here to here, but it wouldn't jump me immediately. That's a very specific critique, but it was actually pretty annoying. Um, yeah. Then, in Alacrity, the terminal that I use, there's this feature, Vim mode, that lets you go anywhere on your screen and copy anything like this, blammo and that applies to TUIs also this feels illegal 
doesn't it? This is because it, it kinda is. <gasps> and now I have this symbol on my clipboard. That's a really cool feature. However, because NeoVi does not under alacrity, it's its own thing, I could not have that feature. Uh, why is it important whatsoever? That is because uh, I can go and copy this uh, nerd font symbol to go use it somewhere. In NeoVide, I did not have that option. Um, I would have to like reopen the place that I saw that symbol uh, in normal Vim or in new Vim in my terminal. Go there again, copy it, close it, and all that stuff. Then, of course, the glaring like thing about Neovide, the fact that it's its own window. You can't inline. Let's try to make a commit message, right? What would happen right now it, is that it would open as a new window here. Uh, when in reality I want to be inlining the editor where I'm making the commit. You can of course do it by just specifying new of them as your git editor. However, using two editors with different semantics would make me have to deal with more like pain in the ass trying to figure out their differences uh, maybe setting different key maps and all that stuff which is why I decided to use Neovide everywhere but the fact that it needed to open a new window it sucked it sucked then Neovide prints way more errors uh, than Neovim. Every time I opened Neovide, it would print something along the lines of xcompose uh, unknown fucking character. It would print this message every single time. And to disable that message, I would have to redirect std error to dev null every single time I use Neovide. And sometimes, and actually oftentimes, when you try to build like build in your editor into another program like Git, you don't really get that option to just redirect, because then you will be redirecting output of git commit, for example as well as from Neovide. This strange error message that just appears out of nowhere for no reason. And that's not the only error message that appeared, there were also more other output that I sincerely did not care about. Uh, and just felt like bloat. For an editor that's supposed to, like... I guess Neovide is not supposed to, sure. But, like... It was really annoying. It was incredibly fucking annoying. Now, the fact that Neovide is a different window is also an advantage. Because you get to use hotkeys that are otherwise taken by your terminal. However, I no longer use Kitty, where I used to have a bunch of different uh, remaps on the terminal level. Right now I use Alacrity, and I have way less hotkeys in Alacrity. Let's go look at Alacrity. Uh, it's not much in comparison. It almost fits on a page. And it would if we do it like this. Yeah, it fits on a page. 
all of my hotkeys for alacrity. This doesn't usually happen whatsoever. So I don't really get that much of a benefit from differentiating new of them uh, keybinds from my terminal keybinds. So all of that negativity, I felt, eh, I'll probably switch back to new of them. Uh, from Neovide. I thought that it would be like difficult to go without animations, but actually it'd been easier than I thought. It was kind of surprising. And the speed benefit, speed benefit that I've gotten in quite a lot of places is actually amazing. I love it. Yeah, so now Neovim is faster, then if I ever want to open an editor while inside of a terminal, I very much can. Um, and yeah, it's pretty neat. I'm really glad that I gave Neovide the chance, but it it's not that it's not for me, it's not for my computer. If it was stronger, I would still be using it. The other stream, I mentioned uh, registers, my global clipboards, that I have 36 of, which is actually a lie, I have... Wait, first of all, no, not 36, 26, second of all, that's also a lie, 52. I have 52 of them. Oh, I guess at that point I had... 26 of them, but now I have 20, uh, 52. So, uh, global clipboards, the ability to interact with 52, oh, plus 10, 62, I guess, uh, different registers. If you're interested in that kind of functionality, I recommend watching that stream because I go in more depth with them. But long story short, I have a bunch of files that I have hotkeys to interact with. Uh, I can truncate a file, I can cut the contents of the file and truncate it. I can just copy the contents of the file, I, I can set the contents of the file to be uh, my clipboard. I can append to a register, I can op uh, open it in new of them, uh, I can directly write to it with Rofi. Uh, I can view it uh, in the notification. Like that. Um, and I can append my clipboard to it, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so. So a bunch of different actions, all of them are on a chord hotkey. It lets me interact with 62 uh, different files. And one thing that I realized is that this is a really good framework uh, for quick access and modifications to different files that I thought, hold up, I had some files like my notes that contain all of the configuration related things that I want to do. I realized that they don't really need to be files. They don't need to be in some directory tracked by Git and all that stuff. Especially notes, since it's so volatile. So I decided, wait, hold up. I can actually just store it in a register. And what this means is that now I can easily view it. Blamo. Um, I can edit my notes, like let's go here for example. I can edit my notes in new of them because it's just a global register that happens to have this information in it. 
so that's pretty nice. I continued on to move a lot of files that used to be like files somewhere uh, and move them into global registers. So stream, for example, all of the things that I want to talk about on stream, blamo, now in a global register so I can open it nicely like this which is super neat. Then, what else do I have? Yeah, links stored here uh, that I can quickly go to and then would you look at that? Hold up, actually, not yet. Uh, let's go to this window and open links here and then I can GX to open this link in the browser window that I'm currently looking at. I, I basically have uh, bookmarks but with the added benefit that copying the link or doing something else is like easier. Boom and I just close it. So, aside from global registers being nice to hold some information temporarily, they can also be used to hold information permanently as like things you consistently come back to and store information in. You should probably back them up, as in I should probably back them up, but I can't be bothered honestly, <laughs> uh, so I don't. Yeah. Then, let's go to daily fish. I have a systemd timer that runs the script every day. And here it has some notifications for me to make sure I know that, oh, you need to do this payment tomorrow. The way I made this notifications in the past is not just like, um, normal notifications like that. No, because they either disappear and if they stay permanently, I will be annoyed with them and I will close them, possibly forgetting what the notification was about. So I needed a way to keep them open for as long as they need to until I dealt with them, until I uh, took medication, for example or did whatever else. <laughs> the way I did it in the past is that I... Um, let me actually just show you. I created a terminal window that ran hola and this is my Rust program that is an infinite loop after maybe printing something. My message, we can provide my message to hola and then when we run this it will open uh, alacrity running hola and printing this message and I would just keep this terminal open for as long as I need to look at the message. And then when I'm done, I would close it. So that was my approach. <laughs> oh, huh. Interesting that I see this error again. It might be from Alacrity, but that wouldn't make sense because I was opening Neovide. Or maybe it appears in both places. Let's actually go look at Xcompose 272. 
X compo wait what? Oh right, X compose, because it's a dot file. 272. What do you mean? Maybe it expects this? We'll see if that changes anything ever. 32. Wait. 32 this. Well, hold up now. So that's not the issue, probably. How? What? Why is it surprised by a double quote here? That's very strange. Regardless. This approach of opening a terminal that just prints a message and infinitely waits is a bit strange. Honestly, it's like strange and whack. I liked it because I actually achieved my goal of having notifications that aren't that annoying and persist infinitely. But not actually infinitely. What happens if I reboot or log out? Those windows will disappear because they're like they're just windows. However, if we were to do the same thing with text with files on the disk, they will not disappear. The text will just stay there even if I reboot or log out. So what if what if I just used some register, 6 for example, no reason about it, not like I use it, no, 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 and just stored the notification text in there. You might say, well, hold up, it's not like you're going to check that register every day. No, I would forget it immediately. But I don't have to remember it because what... Uh, whether text is inside of register 6 is already going to be notified to me by this widget that I have. So if I write to register 6 some text, it will appear here. So if that system D timer um, adds something as a notification, I will see it a bit differently, but I will see it just the same. I'm like, okay, there's something in register six. Uh, let's go look at it like this. Aha, uh -huh, there's some text. Wow, what a useful notification. All right, I handled it. Now I just delete the line. And then there's the next notification because all of them will just be in this file every day. And even if I don't handle some notification uh, on the same day, like immediately, it's still going to be there until I just remove the line. And then when I save, boom, I have handled all of them. There's no longer six here. So that makes more sense and works better and feels nicer, most importantly. Uh, so where were we? Oh. Here. So here I just, why in the living hell, oh, here we go, blamo. So I just uh, append this text to register six, as simple as that. And to make the append situation uh, simpler, I use my program called indeed, which is a Rust program that appends lines on their own lines, <laughs> appends strings on their own lines to a file, and then with this flag it only will append those lines if they aren't already in the file. It used to work differently, it used to only append if there isn't the string on uh, in the file already, like it would do the unique check by default, but I changed it so you have to actually opt into that unique check. And by default, indeed, just appends strings uh, to a file on their own lines. So let me actually show you how it works. Let's go to prog 
and I should probably just make the abbreviation ls to make it easier for me. Okay, so let's create a file. Let's touch cat. Let's cat cat. Nothing. For fuck's sake. Uh, let's indeed cat string one string two. And let's cat cat. And you can see that now it has two lines because it's interpreted uh, string one, string two, and both of them are on their own lines. And there is also no new line. I was always really annoyed that damn near everything just really likes putting uh, a new line at the end of the file. I despise that. I, I think that's useless and annoying in a lot of cases. So I made my program trim new lines if it appends something. Uh, and then we can do dash u to add string 1, string 2, and let's also add string 3. Now when we cat cat, we see that it didn't re-add string 1 or string 2 because they are already in the file, but it did append string and 3 because <laughs> I uh, added a space here accidentally. I was not meant to do that. So yeah, it's uh, pretty convenient <laughs> because the appending situation in shell is actually often pretty annoying to do. It's not straightforward because of uh, the final new line or not. So, with the power of indeed and um, my, I would call it a framework of global registers, um, some silly decisions have now gotten better and I'm really like happy about it because double quote, as I've shown you here, I didn't explain it, but I did show you <laughs> that. Um, actually, let's change this prompt to magazine, because I like it that way. So, quote expects a character and edits the global register at that character. I showed you that in S, I have stream related stuff. So, I do quote S and I'm there. You know, that's, that means I can both do the actions globally, like this, from anywhere, by opening a new window, or maybe appending directly, or writing directly. But if I'm already in new of them, I can just open it directly, with no bullshit. So I have a lot of strong tools to work with them really, really nicely. It's like, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, so that's super, super nice. I love it. Uh, additionally, because this is just a new M instance, that means that once I have opened a register uh, like this, I can then continue on to look at other registers too in the same instance. There's like extra nice. <laughs> I quit Reddit some time ago because I found that it kind of gripped me and I always felt bad about it. It felt like a waste of time. I'm really glad that I quit Reddit. I think it was a good decision. 
but now when I just want to scroll something on my phone I don't have anything to scroll so I still have the same issue I just don't solve it currently which is why I decided to just open fish shell docs on my phone and scroll them and read them while I'm not doing anything and I learned a few stuff a few stuff a few things first of all blammo And I want to show them off. Uh, and that is piping and redirection. I think I finally fully understood all the tools that Fish Shell gives it for uh, for that. Um, currently w wondering how what commands I would sh uh, use to show it to you. I'll use stupid commands and I'll hope you'll just believe me. <laughs> so, uh, you can echo something and then pipe it into another command. In this case, cat uses the output from echo uh, as its input. So, even though it looks the same as if I did this, uh, it is cat that is printing ASDF, but the p the pipe actually only takes in STD out. It does not take STD error. Like if echo wrote an error, it would not be piped into cat, which is usually what we want, but not always. So if we were to redirect. Uh, the uh, output of echo from std out to std error which is how you do it I'll explain it in just a second uh, and so I don't forget let me write it here so if we redirect std out to std error and pipe std out to cat Nothing should have happened. Clearly, I misunderstood something. Hmm. Damn, my entire like speech falls apart now. <laughs> or is it? No, it's definitely toe. Interesting. Ah! Oh! Oh! I see what that. Holy shit, that is so confusing, but makes sense. So, what actually happened here? I was right, but I forgot an important nuance. We redirected output to std error, and so it fucking wrote to std error, and that's what we're seeing. That output uh, went from std out, to std error and then just got printed out while cat didn't know about anything because the std out that was tried to be printed into cat there was no std out because we redirected it does that make sense we moved uh, the normal output to be error output and it just printed to our console while there was no output left to give to the uh, piped command. All right, so um, what this means is that, yeah, the pipe character takes an std out specifically, but you can also uh, only redirect std error. What this will do uh, I'm once again confused, but I don't actually know the answer to this Oh, I see <laughs> Damn, shell is so confusing 
that makes sense once you think about it still doesn't really detract from it being confusing so here with this syntax uh, we redirected SD error or rather we piped it into cat so all errors will be received by cat there were no errors here so we didn't give we didn't give cat anything however echo uh, echo output it asdf and to std out and since this was just expecting errors it gave cat nothing but there was still like normal output uh, so what is this to anyway to in this case is a file descriptor and both in this syntax and in this syntax you can uh, give it a number that is a file descriptor. A file descriptor is effectively a file index. Uh, it refers to a file or folder, if I remember correctly. And one file descriptor one is std in, two is std error, and three, I don't remember what it is. Or maybe zero is std in and one is std out. Yeah, 1 is std out, 2 is std air, and 0 I think is std in, but maybe not, maybe it's 3, I don't remember. But that's the main idea. Like, those are kind of special, and every other one, or most of the other ones, uh, legit just show you the file. Let me actually uh, uh, look at the help page for EZA. And uh, there is a way. Descript? No? no? Really? Then it might be s something else entirely, but. Oh. LGI. This might be something else entirely, but I think these are file descriptors for these files yes they are folders but they're also files i might be wrong and that's actually a completely different number but the idea would be very similar so blamo you can redirect any um, file descriptor either redirect it into a file or redirect it into a command and to redirect it into a file you would do something like this so you redirect error output into dev null which is a special file that takes any input and just eats it does nothing with it it destroys that output so doing something like this is something that I do very often to ignore output. Aren't they the sector address or something? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not actually good at the like low level stuff like that. So I'm just guessing, honestly. <laughs> what is this ampersand character? What does it mean? That is a special uh, neat little abstraction usually what you would do is redirect std out to a file which is dev null to ignore std out nice we ignored std out however there is still std error and we need to redirect that into the file as well however we can just use ampersand to mean both std out and std error we redirect it into a file and both of them are redirected, which is really nice. However, not however, uh, also, the way we could have done this, uh, instead of specifying both of them, uh, we could say, oh, redirect std error to file descriptor one, which is std out. 
and then std out redirect to dev null. So we effectively have two rivers. One is normal output, second is error output. We redirect the second river, the error river, into the normal river, and now they're a single river that gets redirected into a file both. I do not get for the life of me why there are two leading spaces at the end, which I cannot delete by the way. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is another way of doing it. There is also this operator, some file. What is this? This will redirect output, in this case std out, stdr, both, but um, like into a file, but only if that file doesn't already exist. If this file exists, it will not redirect output. I think it will ignore it. Let's actually check that. Um, temp v cat temp. Mm -hmm. What happens if we do it again? Ah, it will give you an error. It will not even run the command. That's interesting. Um, not sure if this is a behavior that I actually would want. But yeah, interesting to figure that out. Ah, uh, wait, no. Yeah, it erroring out actually makes the most sense. Because then you can get to decide what it does. So yeah, uh, seems like a cool thing. I'm not sure like where I would need it, because I haven't yet. But seems pretty nice. But the reason it exists is because sometimes you want to keep the output uh, in the file. So what you could do instead is a append output into a file executes temp, what's in temp, sdf, execute it again, now it has sdf, sdf, execute it again, you get the picture, so this uh, appends output of std out into the temp file, similarly you can output or append error into temp, SDF is not a command, it's just some random string. Uh, random string. So you might think, oh, then we can do this. For some odd fucking reason we cannot. <laughs> this is just not a feature. So what you would have to do uh, is um, do something like redirect std out to std error and then std error to a temp or I guess the more reasonable way of doing it is redirect std error into std out and then all of the std out redirect to the file and then it will do what you would expect this to do kind of unfortunate but once you realize and understand file redirection with std and std out it's not too big of a deal However, this is unreasonably long to actually type out in a command line. I personally wouldn't. Uh, I would probably make some sort of mapping for it, some sort of abbreviation that can expand anywhere. Um, yeah. What's in there? Yeah, I explained it. And that's mostly it, right? I don't remember if I uh, explained this, but you can do this to pipe both both std out and std in uh, into another program. Wait, you cannot? Why is it red? Oh. Ah, this is the syntax. This is the syntax. I'm sorry. Boom. This uh, uh, pipes both std in and std out 
to the program. Uh, this, I assume. Ah, uh, how strange. What in a living fuck? Yeah, I, I see why I got confused and thought that it was this. <laughs> That's really strange. So, yeah, to pipe only errors into a program, you do it like this, but to output both errors and normal output, you do it like this. Really, really strange. This would make no sense, of course, yeah. Uh, so I think that's most of it, if not completely all of it. Let me try to recollect it in my mind. Yeah, yeah. That's all there is to redirection and piping in fish shell, I'm pretty sure. I wish I had someone to explain it to me, like way in the past, because <laughs> this shit is not obvious whatsoever, uh, and I've never seen like a tutorial on this, especially for fish shell, that just explains it. I'm not gonna claim that I did a very good job explaining it, but I at least did, you know? <laughs> I, at least I explained it somewhat, because the docs often expect you to already know the information they're explaining, uh, and when you're just learning about all of this stuff, it's uh, it can be hard to understand it. But this is actually super fucking powerful. I made a Bluetooth selector. Uh, it's just a nice UI abstraction over Bluetooth CTL. I need to fucking fix this. Uh, let's go to Confish. It's like really annoying me. Mm hmm. For key F5, it said, I think. F5. Let's restart. Yeah, so Bluetooth CTL. Boom. Nice, it works. <laughs> that you can use on Linux to do different stuff with Bluetooth. Blamo. This is my interface. I can toggle Bluetooth on or off. It's currently on, which you can also see. Oh, interesting. Chrome, it doesn't work here? That's kind of surprising. Uh, you can also see by this widget, it is on. Uh, keep looking there. I toggle Bluetooth off, and now it's not there. Let's turn it back on. Oh, by the way, the prompt changed here. Wait, I can't even do that, that's crazy. Oh, I can. Hey, <laughs> hey. Um, so yeah, it was off. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. However, <laughs> it is bad and way too personalized uh, for me to like, uh, I guess, share it as a nice little script, because it only works for me. <laughs> Uh, still, I wanted to show it off. So, and then I can connect the three Bluetooth devices that I can possibly ever connect. My headphones, my earphones, and my speaker. Wait, that's crazy. All of them are from GBL, actually. Holy shit. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, but it also that's kind of surprising, you know? Damn. Three fucking GBL products. That's wild. Um, yeah, so this is really convenient. Now I can like pull out my earphones uh, and to connect them because I don't do trust for my earphones. I don't want them to automatically connect because in Bluetooth, 
you can trust a device and that means that it will try to automatically connect once that device wants to connect to something. I did this for my headphones so that when I turn them on, they automatically connect. I do not want that behavior for my earphones because I generally use them with my phone specifically. Nice, I made a Wi-Fi manager with D-Menu. Nice, I actually uh, intended to make a Wi-Fi manager as well. Kind of like this, but for Wi-Fi. But also very much uh, considered using Rofi instead of D-Menu. Rofi is basically, not basically, it is objectively better than D-Menu. It's very, very rare that any programs are ever objectively better. Because you can usually argue for both sides. But genuinely, Rofi has every feature that D-Menu has and more, significantly more. And if you don't like how expansive and nice Rofi looks, if you like your programs to be ugly, uh, you can make it ugly. And okay, fairly easily is a bit of a stretch. Um, you might spend some time configuring how it looks, but that's on you. It's not really Rofi's fault that it has so many options, you know? So I super, super recommend uh, Rofi instead of D-Menu. Uh, so, if I want to connect my earphones to my laptop, which is not always, I can just use this picker and then blammo and I get connected. Instead of bl connect ear, which is the command that it actually runs. What the fuck is that? If I echo ear, this is just the Mac uh, of my earphones. If I do Bluetooth CTL devices, it will show me all the Mac addresses, which I hope I can show you. It'd be surprising if I shouldn't. Um, yeah, so that's how it works. Effectively, I keep uh, the MAC address of my headphones, speaker, and earphones in global variables, and that's it. <laughs> so, that's why I said that this uh, Bluetooth picker only works for me. Yeah. So it's not very good. <laughs> uh, but I do find it very useful. So I'll still show you the idea of the code. How do I implement get Bluetooth, I wonder? Like this. Uh, and then I check the power. Then I check whether a device is connected, like this. If it is connected, I specify uh, one thing in the prompt, if it is not, another. So that's how it actually displays with either a cross or a check uh, all the devices that are connected. If I Actually, let me connect my headphones right now. They will connect. This uh, widget will update. Oh, w really? I, it decides to not connect right now. Okay, whatever. It's probably a sign from the universe that they shouldn't. Yeah, so basically it would show up here. Uh, as checked to mean, oh, this is connected, which is really nice, because not only is this uh, a thing that lets me actually do stuff, it also shows information. And similarly, I check for earphones and for speaker, and you can see here that it's just using a global variable that I happen to have. Cool. Then I print that list. Uh, that I have now done. Yes, I was making a list, by the way. 
uh, print to Rofi so that I can pick between them. If I actually picked something, then let's see what I picked. And depending on what I picked, do different actions with go to CTL. And then update my widget Blemo. That's the rough idea. And you can see here that I append output to a file. A append error output to a file. See where it can be useful? Because otherwise this function would actually print the errors. Uh, because it's used in the hotkey, um, well, I guess that doesn't matter. Yeah, oh, wait, yeah, it does matter, but in a different way. Because this runner Bluetooth thing is in a hotkey. If there's any any errors ever, I will not see them. But because they are in a file, I can just go to this file and fucking look at it. You know? Uh huh. That was the error. I see kind of thing. Ooh, this is really fucking good. Oh, this is so good. We're getting good today, god damn. Uh, so, my global registers framework. Amazing. Incredible. What this also means is that now I can fucking look wait no wrong thing i can look what track is currently playing in my player is it this super fucking cool that's super cool and then i can also um go look what album i'm currently listening to i did not know that it was an album wait is it yeah yeah it's an album and I was able to get information from fucking anywhere. Because it's just in a file. We can go edit it. It's literally here. Then I can do chord hotkey C to copy the output of that file. T. And now I can just paste this anywhere. Motherfucker asks, oh, what, what are you listening to? Blammo, I got that shit on lock. I just pasted it immediately because it's just stored in the file. How do I do this? Uh, in a kind of ass way, you could argue. Let's go to widget update, media title, and this gets media title, and then writes it to global register T, if something has changed, because usually it will not. Uh, as I'm listening to the track, the title will st stay the same. Uh, and then it also prints um, the album title to a different register now. So because of this strength of the framework of registers, I can just have information lying in them permanently. What I could also do is store the window title of the current window, but I just haven't needed it yet, so I haven't done it. But I very much could, like, easily. I probably should, by all accounts. Yeah, so here I am using player CTL to get the uh, album uh, title. And player CTL is what I use for all of my media changing stuff. Stuff like change media volume. Yeah. It is supposed to work, by the way. Yeah, indeed, you cannot hear that. That's good. That's good. Huh. Oh, now it works. Here we go. Yeah, I'm currently changing uh, the volume of the media player. In this case, Spotify. Uh, 
Um, and player CTR can do other stuff, like skip to the next track. Then, amazingly, I can... Um, I don't remember what, what the alias is. Uh, media less, I think, 60 seconds. Right? Yeah, and if you noticed, it was 3.09 and now it's 2.09. I jumped back 60 seconds in the current player. How fucking amazing is that? So, player CTL is amazing. Um, and it is also how I get the title and the album. Let's go here. That's how I do it. I get um, the artist and I get the title. Let me actually explain this, because uh, this is a part that I forgot to tell you about in my section on redirection and piping. You can... How do I say this? You can combine the outputs of multiple commands into a single block and then redirect output of that entire block into some other command or file. So either redirect or pipe. To get this functionality, you can just use begin end to start the block now the outputs of these two commands are um, like tied together because if we tried to do it this way uh, like oh execute this command and then this command and then output or rather pipe it to string join like this this would not work this would only Um, concatenated would actually be incorrect in the context of fish. I'll explain that. What happens here is that only the format title is being joined with a dash. Joined with nothing, so there's no dash. And what ends up happening is that the artist and the title just get printed on their own lines. So nothing happens here, because uh, this output is not joined with this output. However, if you do them in a block, their outputs are all together. Why is it not concatenation? Because they're not concatenated um, because the semantics of piping or redirection, hmm, well I guess Yeah, okay, I see that what I was thinking of. Yeah, they are concatenated. The difference is that how string join interprets that. Because they are on separate lines and they are in a single block, uh, they are then split by new lines as two separate arguments to string join that takes us to the end. And the way string join works specifically is that you either specify arguments here, they are separate, all of these need to be separate, or I kind of wish that didn't happen, <laughs> uh, or by um, redirecting a bunch of different lines into it. So that's why we need to do it uh, with a block. Other ways to make a block is a for loop, a while loop, uh, a switch statement, and if also as well. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So all of those can group a bunch of commands together uh, into a single output stream which also has its own 
std error and std out. And then similarly, you can also do this. And you can also do this to only string join the errors from here. And then interestingly, you can redirect um, redirect std out into errors and then it will get picked up by this and be piped into string join eventually uh, like this now all of them write to std error this is picked up uh, this is picking up std error and pipes it into string join so they're both separate and combined uh, output streams which gives you a lot of power if you understand it. <laughs> and considering that fish shell is my favorite language, I shit you not, it is my favorite programming language. Nope, not Rust. I know it's surprising even to me, but fish shell is actually my fucking favorite programming language. I know it's fun. It, it's kind of like I'm doing magic. That once I understand actually makes sense. <laughs> It's quite silly. <laughs> Still find this fucking hilarious. I'm using an Amogus character as a sentinel value. Uh, it's so funny. <laughs> I'll fucking bite my ass uh, the day that some album is going to be uh, called the Amogus character. And this specific one, like, to add. The thing about it is that it can happen. <laughs> With the music that I listen to, I can't exactly pull the strangest album name out of my ass, like, on the spot. But it is very possible that some artist that I listen to just releases an album, which name is the Amogus character. And by the way, I feel so proud that I would actually be able to search for it, because I know the Unicode uh, of the character, Blamo, and I would be able to search for it. I think I already talked about this. Yes, I did. I'm very glad you asked. Uh, it redirects std out into nowhere. So effectively, it ignores output. Uh, let's echo some string and pipe it into dev null. Nothing happens because we piped std out to this special file that just ignores all input. Uh, we can also pipe all errors to dev null. So, um, what's a command that likes to make errors very often? Uh, I don't have Neovide installed anyway, or anymore. Maybe something like Alacrity? No, no errors here. E, hold up my message. Does it? No, really? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it uh, redirects, like it's a special file, oh sorry. It's a special file that ignores all input. I can't think of a program that likes to print errors, but effectively, uh, this annoying fucking program, God, I hate it, because it keeps giving you errors that, I, that you really don't care about, and you're just like, haha, fucking Fuck you. 
and you just ignore all errors and you only see the normal output that goes to STD out. Maybe you're like, nah, -uh, I only care about the errors. Maybe it's a program uh, that gives you useless output, but the errors might be actually useful. Then you would do this to say, ignore all normal output, but do show me the errors. Or if you don't care about the output of it at all, you do this. You're like, just execute this. I do not care about the input, whether or not it's an error. This is then extra useful because of something very specific. You can start uh, a program as a background process. This does not always work, but if you disown it, uh, then it will work. However, without this, what will happen if you try to start this is that, let me actually give you a more concrete example. I start Alacrity, and this is now the Alacrity window. However, look here, a new prompt is not being printed. That is because uh, this process is tied to this terminal. It is waiting for Alacrity to exit before it can print a new prompt. Keep looking at the prompt and see me close this Alacrity window. Now there's a new prompt. So it was waiting for Alacrity to close before it to could continue. However, uh, if we do it like this, uh, it is now a, a process of this terminal. You can see it by the cog. That's a terrible color that they decided to use. Um, you can see it by the cog. This terminal is tied uh, to this terminal. So if I remember correctly, if I close this terminal, it will close the attached terminal as well. Boom. I closed the parent one and the child one closed as well. But if I disown it, this is no longer the issue. Um, first of all, you see that there's no cog. This terminal is not related. Hold up, that's not very visual. Um, this terminal is not related to this terminal. Uh, so this is the parent terminal, yes, and it did start this terminal, yes, but it disowned it, it is no longer a child of this terminal, they are separate. Um, so if I close the parent terminal, the, the child terminal still stays, because it, it is disowned, it is no longer a child terminal, it is on its own. However, there's always a however. Um, hmm. Fuck. How do I, how can I force a program that can be... Mm. Mm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, fuck, GIMP is fucking huge though. Mm, I'm trying to think of a program that prints a lot of errors. Oh, this for sure um, will make an error. Let's repeat this process with the last appearance so you can see a pattern of how this works. Because uh, I do realize this is not obvious fucking whatsoever. It is very confusing and difficult. Uh, but as you keep seeing it and using it, you start to understand it and how you can make use of it uh, for yourself in your shell experience. So I start this program. Yep, as expected, it holds the prompt. Okay, let's close it. Let's now uh, start it as a background process. Mm -hmm. There is a cog uh, and it is not holding. But if I were to close this, it will close this. I'm not going to do it, just trust me. Or check for yourself, I guess. Um, if I disown it, 
Opening your browser gives a lot of text and warnings. Does it count as an error? Yes, probably. Uh, and the way you could check that is my browser. Um, you can redirect all output into dev null, and then what will happen is that you will only see the errors. Or if you want to see only the normal output, you do this. Uh, so that's how you would check whether it's printing errors or just normal output. They're probably all errors. However, I just don't want to open another browser because I already have three fucking instances. Uh, so it's a mess, even more so than GIMP, you know? Okay, now we do LX appearance disown to mean start this as a background process and disown it. Make this terminal not the parent terminal of that process. So what we expect is that, uh-huh, okay, so uh, the output will just uh, disappear because we disowned this process, this terminal and the program of LX appearance are no longer related. Keep that idea in your mind. They're no longer related. However, um, I, <laughs> I only just now realized that LX appearance does not make any errors, which is strange and surprising. Uh, mm, fuck, what, what, like, easy program that's not going to be too annoying gives a lot of errors for no reason. What do I have? Um, I really don't want to open GIMP, it's really fucking huge. Ooh, Zath, Zath, Zathura, maybe. This does it? Yeah, here we go. So what happened here? Don't worry about this. What happened here is that we uh, opened Zath Zathura and disowned it. To mean, okay, those are no longer connected this terminal and um, compile a code file with an error maybe. That's kind of too much effort, not gonna lie. Um, it's a good suggestion, I just, eh, you know. So they're supposed to be not connected, they're separate. However, what in the living and dying hell is this? This is a fucking error message. And a useful, useless one at that. Why is it here? You might think, well, hold up. Did the disown and background process, so did disowning and background process fail maybe? And that's why it's writing to here? No, because if I, uh, like, repaint my shell prompt, whoops, here, if I repaint my shell prompt, it's not holding and it's not cogging. So I did disown it, and it did start as a background process. That is correct. However, this is really fucking strange, and I do not get why it works this way. It's really fucking stupid. Even though I disowned this process and like said, shush, go away, I don't care about you anymore, you're not my daughter, it still prints its output into this terminal. I disowned this child, saying, I don't care about you anymore, you're a drug addict, I hate you, uh, now you have to live for yourself, and yet they still text me for money. I would be angry too. Uh, so we have to explicitly redirect output to dev null. And now, let's close this first. And now, when we open it, we get no error output anymore because we specifically ignored it and then started as a background process that we also disowned. Now, this Zathura window is actually untied to this terminal. You can continue using this terminal without being worried about any errors just randomly appearing in the middle of your prompt. Which used to happen to me and I could not understand why. Now I know. 
I didn't read about it. I'm pretty sure I guessed it or saw it somewhere. So I wouldn't say it's like particularly obvious. Um, but yeah, that's how you can use the fish shell. I'm sure Bash has some rules around these too, uh, but they'll probably work a bit differently and maybe worse. Um, yeah, so all of this is really, really powerful and really important uh, if you want to make your shell workflow nicer. Like genuinely, if you enjoy using the terminal, to make it a more reasonable experience, this is like pretty important knowledge. Damn. Hell yeah. Uh, I kind of wish there was like a good tutorial that you can just search for uh, and watch and everything is explained to you kind of like I did just now but in a more collected manner uh, like videos generally are because this is a stream and <laughs> it's pretty weird that I stream but it's as if I'm making videos here I'm sure you noticed you're not stupid uh, I go from topic to, to topic as if I am recording a video, which I'll then edit. But I will not edit this. Uh, this is a stream, and I'm live. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, no, it's not pre-recorded. Um, why do I do it this way? Because I cannot be bothered to fucking edit videos. God, I hate editing. It is so depressing. Yes, depressing. Because I get to see all of my mistakes uh, while... Let me actually mute. I get to see all of my mistakes while editing, and I judge myself harshly for them. Even though you, as the viewer, uh, either just don't notice things as much, maybe you don't care as much, or maybe you clicked, clicked off the video calmly, because like, eh, it's kind of ass, you know? Um, but I, I can't be like this forgiving to myself, which is why I no longer make videos and make streams instead, which I don't have to edit. Technically I should if I wanted to grow my channel more, but I uh, don't care about it that much. Where was I going with this? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I wish that someone that actually enjoyed uh, making videos or was more motivated to grow their channel actually made a tutorial like I just did, but in a better format. Um, so that people could uh, search for it, learn from it, and not have to painstakingly understand this from experience. You never want to understand something programming related from experience. That is terrible. And it's true that it's technically in the docs, but scattered around and not shown with examples as to how this can be useful. I'm kind of lying because uh, it was in the section uh, in the fish shell docs, and that's how I understood it, I guess. But that pure, inf pure information wasn't enough for me to fully understand it all, you know? So yeah. Uh, I kind of wish there was a nice tutorial, uh, but I'm not gonna be the person to make it. Or maybe you actually understood everything from my explanation, in which case I'm glad. Compose. Now, this is really fucking powerful. This is really cool. Incredibly cool. Uh, let's open... Oops, not here. But here instead. Wait. No, it doesn't. Wait, hold on. This is the first. 
This is the second. Uh, looking at my window widget currently, I forgot to notice that it actually respects the indexes. So this is the first window, this is the second, this is the third. In Awesome Window Manager, unfortunately, uh, you can only move to the next or previous window. You can't go directionally like in other window managers. And this is the fourth window. So we can look at this widget to figure out where to go, to which direction, uh, which is kind of confusing when I have three windows. Didn't know about that, and I fucking made it. <laughs> uh, so I go left. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, so let's open a blank buffer. A compose key you can set and it will let you insert uh, a special character by combining a few other characters. For example, I press my compose key. Oh, it even says that. Oh, wow. Uh, what? Holy shit. <laughs> what? That's kind of surprising. Then I press N and tilde and it enters the fucking nya. The fucking nya. Uh, thingy. Uh, then you can also insert yeah. You can insert yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> How do you pronounce that? Yeah, I think yeah. Definitely that. Definitely. It's definitely not different for language. Uh uh. uh you can uh, enter your. Wait, oh, that's a whole different thing. Well, I guess let me just show you. Um, you can enter your, wait, that's your, for fuck's sake, how do I enter that? I forget. Oh, maybe like that? Oh, maybe like that. Huh. How do you enter it? I don't remember. Yeah, but that's a different thing. Um, effectively, you combine a character. Even that, that, oh wow. Yeah, but, but I was uh, talking about this. A letter that exists in Russian. It looks really cute. But I don't remember what I need to press after a letter uh, to give it like two dots above but you can do that effectively wait is it uh, e wait no I already tried that damn I generally don't know it might be in the default but maybe because I uh, like changed the default maybe because of that it doesn't work anymore who knows nope not that but yeah, the idea is that you insert a character and then uh, another symbol that resembles whatever it is and you get the character that kind of combines them. What this also means is that you can actually configure it. You can make your own uh, special characters be inserted from your key sequences. See what I'm doing here? I'm just inserting emojis um, from my own compose sequences. Th those are not defaults. I think this is a default. Uh-huh, so I do somehow override some of them. Interesting. I know, right? That's like amazing. That is incredible! This is so good! This can become your emoji picker for emojis that you use constantly. Because, I mean, I guess you could also literally make this for every single emoji, because it's not in the defaults. Uh, 
but you probably wouldn't bother doing that, and even I didn't. And I like bothering a lot. Um, yeah, what else do I have? I have pink heart, I have yellow heart. See, I'm just inserting uh, a few letters, and that ends up being some character. Uh, the defaults are reasonable to a degree. They often... Um, the defaults are often how the character looks, and you combine a few uh, letters and special symbols that together resemble another character. But there's like the default file is like 6,000 lines long, and I spent quite a few hours filtering it down and then reconfiguring it to use my sequences instead. So now I have quite a quite quite less of them. Um, so first of all, let's go look at the default one. Um, wait, I can actually open it here. Let's go to user sh uh, share x eleven. Mm -hmm. Good question. I'll. I'll show it to you. Uh, I'll explain it. First, let's look at the default file. Actually, yeah, no, let's look at the default file first. I think that will make more sense. Uh, XKB, wait, that's a different thing. Um, hmm, user share. It's in my pride to remember this path. X11, locale, right? Locale, mm hmm, and us us utf8 compose blamo this is the default file it looks really ugly i agree and interestingly in vim and neovim uh if you set file type to compose it has custom huh <laughs> kind of eating my words am i not oh is that maybe x compose Come X what is it? What the fuck is it? Hold that. It's a thing, because I have a special um rule for it. Uh-huh. Set file type X compose. Oh, here it is, blamo. Uh, why did it not autocomplete? That's strange. So yeah. Strangely enough, Vim and NeoVim has custom syntax highlighting for xcompose files. <laughs> Which is really fucking cool. You'll never fucking see this in VS Code. Or at least I would be surprised if you could. Uh, so, here it defines all of the default ones. And I just continue on scrolling. I'm literally holding down the key. We're not even halfway done, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'll scroll through it fully, or 70% in, okay, maybe not 6, but 5, and a bit, blammo, so it has a lot of stuff, um, it's a lot to go through, and there are a lot of defaults, I can't exactly give you an overview, but, because I don't remember that overview, I overrode it, but you can look through parts of it to maybe remember some of the reasonable defaults to then come back to uh, do your own thing. Okay. So, this is my own xcompose file. Where are you supposed to make it? You're supposed to make it in dot x compose x compose like this in your home directory yes i know it's annoying that you have to put yet another file in your home directory and maybe there's a way to put it somewhere else to like hide it i don't know if that's the case because x compose is not like um modern i guess enough to be reasonable so you put this file there And before I go on to the syntax, let's actually 
talk about the compose key. How do you set that key? Um, it doesn't have to be a physical key. It can be a key combination. Let's go to X set. This, yeah, blamo. Yeah, you use set XKB map and provide an option. Nope, not that. Uh, provide an option uh, that is compose colon and then whatever this is. To elaborate on that, Sex, uh, set XKB uh, map. It's used to add different features to your layout. Stuff like adding another language layout, like what I do here. I add a uh, Russian layout as well, because I need to use it sometimes, unfortunately. Uh, and also options. For example, what you can do is make it so when, I, when you press both shifts, you activate caps lock. I actually used to use that when I was on KDE and well I could use it still right now if I wanted to I just don't want to um, this should be hold on like this uh, not should be I just prefer it and in this case we set the compose key to scroll lock how would you know that you wouldn't, you just straight up fucking wouldn't. Um, set XKB map. Maybe it's in the help page. <laughs> Why would it be in the help page? That would be stupid, right? Maybe it's in the man page. I mean, it would be reasonable if it was in the man, man page. Option. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no! <laughs> why would it be in the man page? Why why would it be in the docs? <laughs> Are users gonna use this? Fuck no, of course not. That would be stupid. Now, obviously I'm hoping that it's somewhere in there, but it's not easily searchable at the very least, and I would not be surprised if it's not there. So um, I actually stored this somewhere. Let me remember where. Um, compose. Let's go look at it. Wait, no, this. Compose, maybe? No. Mm. XKB map, then I probably have it here. XKB, no. Wait, all XKB map. I noticed something there. Blamo. Here it is. Yes, the way you figure out all of the options that you can set is of course from a random ass github gist because of course why would you read the docs on the program to figure out how to use the program you instead go look it up on some very random hidden place by some user that painstakingly uh, fucking found them probably in, in the source code Forget about the source code. They're not even specified in the source code somehow uh, So that user probably just um, Like hacked into the mainframe and Like raw powered figuring all of them out <laughs> Essentially, I'm like very annoyed uh, with it because it was difficult to figure out with Blamo, now you have all of those options, uh, and somewhere in here, uh, you can see 
compose key, position of the com compose key, and it tells you all of the options that you have to set the compose key for. Yes, unfortunately, options. You cannot just set uh, any key to the compose key. You have to choose out of these. Why? Good question. I am crying also about this terribleness, honestly. So yeah, you pick a key that you want to use for your compose key. I chose scroll lock. <laughs> I was about to <laughs> surround this. <sighs> yeah, I chose scroll lock. Why scroll lock? Because in my uh, X remap, scroll lock, I set a different, a more convenient to press hotkey to act as scroll lock. And then it is recognized by set, uh, set XKB map as the compose key. So that's the setup. I will. Uh, laptop keyboard don't have scroll lock, right? Yeah, but I use a um, external keyboard anyway. And probably technically, uh, if I pressed Fn plus print screen, I would probably get to scroll lock or something. But regardless, you don't actually have to physically have the key, because uh, you can use a program. Uh, like X remap for example, I personally recommend it. Um, scroll lock to remap your actual hotkey or your actual key into a key that's accepted by XKB map. Uh, and then at this point, oh yeah, I wanted to actually give you this command. Boom. But you would actually remove this if you don't want the Russian layout, which is ideal. Do not have it. And boom, now you have the compose key, uh, log out or reboot, and then it will be active. And then you'll be able to do stuff like uh, yeah which is really cool already. And Compose Key works in my memory everywhere. Interestingly, uh, you can press Control shift u in most places on Linux to start inserting a character by its Unicode. And I can insert the Amogus character like this. And this feature works in most places, but not everywhere. If I try to do it in my terminal, Nothing happens. Nothing happens. What are you making right now? Uh, I'm not making anything actually. I'm showing you what the compose key is and why it's super powerful. Because um, it actually can be used for something much more sinister than what I use it for. So stick to the end to find that out. <laughs> How YouTubers say that. So Control shift u doesn't work everywhere, but the Compose key does work, once again, in my memory everywhere. Blammo! I can insert an emoji uh, in my terminal. So now, let's go to xcompose. Um, the actual Unicode is just D9E. It showed a U there to kind of show you that, oh, currently you're inserting a Unicode. So just insert D9E and you will get an Amogus character. And you can press either Enter or uh, Space or D9E, you can press Control shift u again and it and that will complete the symbol and enter you into another session um, of inserting a Unicode character. 
So this is the syntax of the compose configuration. You say multi-key, multi-key is your compose key. Then each um, character, rather each letter or symbol that you need to type in is in brackets like this. So looky here. Isn't that super cool, right? Um, I say compose key, S K U. I get skull, just like defined here. Um, yeah. And here I have some emojis that I use very often. You might ask, how do I specify a special character uh, that is not just a letter, but maybe like period, dot, etc. Uh, no clue. The way that I figured these out is by just looking at the uh, default uh, compose file that uses all of them. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. And by looking at them, you can figure out what they're supposed to be named. I'm sure you can also find some random GitHub gist that contains all of them, but I haven't found it because I haven't looked for it. So that's how. And here I have a bunch more special characters that I get to design my own compose sequences for. Here I have a bunch of errors, for example. Um, let me actually give you the path uh, to my compose file. That link is dynamic and this one is static. Oops. Yeah, so I can go on and insert uh, a cool arrow or this one stuff like that. Isn't that super fucking cool? Oh yeah, actually, to mean uh, a an uppercase letter, you just uppercase it. No, like, shift plus or anything like that. Yeah. Boom. So, even though I have my own compose file, the defaults still exist. They're just overridden by my um, personal configuration. So, if something from my configuration doesn't let the default configuration work uh, because it overrides it, then it won't. But Uh, like, for example, hmm. yeah, so I don't have this. Oh, wait, what? Huh. What I'm currently talking about is usually the case. Hmm, what about this? Oh yeah, huh, interesting. So this didn't used to be the case, which is really strange, but right now I think my compose configuration fully overrides the default config, but the default is that the default the like your config just stands on top of the default uh config, you know? I'm not sure why I don't uh, have the same case. It's pretty strange. So, the cool feature that I was talking about is that what you compose into doesn't have to be a single character. These are three symbols. Three separate symbols, Unicode symbols, that when combined together turn into this. Which is pretty cool. So this emoji 
is comprised of three symbols. What this means then is that you can use compose sequences to enter entire fucking text. Here's an entire sentence of text that will be nicely inserted. In other words, what this means is that Linux also has hot strings, just like what a hotkey does. But these hot strings are instead of uh, instead are done by the compose key. You can literally make your own snippets, global snippets that will work everywhere. Um, because you might want them everywhere. Maybe there's a sentence that you keep needing to say, say maybe you have a Discord server and you need to moderate it, um, and you keep saying, oh my god, I hate you so much. How dare you break the rules? Maybe you're a mod that really cares uh, <laughs> about the rules. And you keep saying this specific sentence with no differences, by the way. And you're tired of constantly typing it in. Well, blammo, now you can just make a compose sequence for this text, and then uh, you can just say compose uh, my compose sequence, and it will enter that sentence. Very specific. <laughs> I'm not actually referencing anything. You would think that this is a reference to something, it is not. Well, I guess it's a reference to how annoyed, how easily annoyed I can be when people come into the AutoHotKey Discord server and start talking about some Rule 5 shit. It annoys me quite a bit. So I guess I'm referencing that. Yeah, so that's the biggest power of the Compose key. Aside from just making some special symbols very easy to input, I can very easily say something like my number top two and blammo. Uh, I just inserted an uppercase number. And yes, indeed, I'm going to call them an uppercase number. I think that's funnier, so therefore is better. Uh, yeah, like these special symbols being able, uh, being easy to insert is already amazing, but then you can just set it to text that you get to decide. It is amazing. It is incredible. It is true that Windows also has this feature via auto hotkey and with more features and it is overall better, but Linux has it too and it has everything else to be better and much better. So I think Linux wins. <sighs> I actually do use more emojis, but the reason why there aren't that many emojis here is because honestly oops that's actually the wrong one which is kind of funny because it counter proves my point uh, I'm so used to inserting emojis by their unicodes that I'm not that interested in making compose sequences and memorizing uh, them um, when I already have Unicode's memorized. So I only do the compose key uh, for things that I do really often, or if they are multiple symbols, where I would have to um, insert them way too often. Or rather, um, let's try to insert uh, this thing. I can insert it like this with a compose, or I can insert it via three different symbols. First of all is 1F937, 
then 200D, this is the zero width joiner, and then 2640. Interestingly, it works here, but it doesn't work on Discord, uh, which is why what I would need to do is use my own custom thing that lets me use the Control Shift uh, U feature everywhere, like this. I can just insert all of my things here. Blammo, now it's in my clipboard. We can look at it. Blammo, I just paste it. Oh, so it did indeed not work. And now it does. Blammo. Um, so yeah, doing this every time I want to use this emoji would be pretty annoying. Uh, which is why I have the compose sequence for it. But as you can see clearly here, I do still remember the Unicodes to actually make it if I do feel like so. Uh, so, compose keys for special symbols that just don't make sense to use as Unicodes, because uh, maybe they have pairs in some sort of fashion, like here. Uh, those that are way too many to memorize like this this and especially all of these that's like a lot and that makes no sense to memorize the unicode self uh, and also possibly symbols that are nerd font symbols which aren't proper unicode and those also kind of make no sense to memorize the unicode self you know but maybe i will in the future and for emojis uh, that are multiple symboled. That is what I use uh, the compose key for personally. However, you can also use it for straight up sentences, stuff that you need to write kind of often. And I probably should like get into that. I just haven't found anything that I keep repeating, so. Wait, I could do something like, I could do something like um, uh, get, uh, and then GitHub. I could do something like this, and and then when I do compose git, I would paste uh, the GitHub link to my profile, and then another thing for my email. You know, that's pretty neat. I could use that, but currently I don't think I want to. I'll see if that kind of thing repeats itself, and if it does, I'll make some. That's a pretty cool idea. And then, my DOS files are public, uh, so I can't exactly say password and then uh, enter my, pa my actual password here because then you guys would be able to see it, obviously, because my dot .files are public. Uh, and then I would either need to hide the xcompose file, uh, make it, like, not public, or somehow source the file. That's just kind of annoying, which is why I just won't do it. Uh, but my email, GitHub, uh, channel, that's a pretty good use of a compose key. Yeah, so... I hope that stirred up some ideas in your mind as to how you can use the Compose key to your uh, benefit. And at this point, thank you for watching. I hope you learned a bunch of stuff today, because I definitely talked about a lot of stuff like, god damn, how long have we been streaming for? Right, it doesn't say, wait, no, it does, I'm stupid, for two hours, nice. Uh, thank you for watching. I'll see